After three straight NCAA tournament appearances, UMass had the highest expectations in a program history heading into the 94-95 season. With all five starters returning from the previous campaign, including seniors Lou Rowe, Derek Kellogg, and Mike Williams, UMass was ranked number three in the preseason poll. Right away, the Minutemen had an opportunity to make a statement as the season opener pitted Coach Cal's squad against Nolan Richardson and the defending national champion Arkansas Razorbacks. Was down in Springfield in the tip-off game, um, the best tip-off game and will never be matched. The electricity in that building on that game was like nothing I'd ever seen. People, it felt like they were just on top of you, like in the, on the ceiling, on the court, everywhere. Arkansas was number one in the country at that time. And we got Arkansas number one in the nation, Massachusetts number three, Springfield, Massachusetts. The fans are ready, Rowe is ready, Camby's ready, Williamson is ready, Thurman's ready. It's going to be awesome, baby. And Mike Williams, we suspended him for the game and everybody didn't think we'd win. And, and I think it was Corliss Williamson that publicly said that our second team can beat any team in the country. The game starts and Lou Rose steals the tip and comes down the court with an unbelievable two-handed slam. The building just absolutely fell apart. I mean, it was loud and people were going crazy. You couldn't talk to the person sitting next to you. We blew them out. For me, it was just surreal. I, I was like, is this really happening? I think we shocked the world. You know, guys came out and played with a chip on their shoulder. And I don't know if Arkansas took it lightly, but we were definitely ready and gunning for them. So UMass just absolutely dominated that game, became the number one team in the nation for the first time. The first time not only for UMass's history, but in the history for any New England team in the 45-year history of the AP poll. The Minutemen lost the number one ranking the next week, but then reeled off 16 straight victories and regained the top spot in early January, holding that honor for a month. It wasn't UConn, it wasn't Holy Cross, it, wasn't, it was, wasn't BC, it was that little old team in Amherst that was the number one team in the country, the first ever in New England. So much of what I had experienced through other players, I was now experiencing because you know, the team had achieved the number one ranking in the country. That was way beyond anything we had thought about when I was in college. To be number one in the country for six weeks, walking around campus, the vibe around campus, the, you know, the vibe anywhere you went, in the grocery store, in the mall. You jumped out of bed in the morning and you went to bed at night and you couldn't fall asleep because you were on such a high, it was just incredible. I would describe that time as, as nutty because uh, it was the team and the place to see and be seen. The atmosphere every night was terrific. It was really like hanging with rock stars. As part of the 17 and one start to the season, UMass pulled off some heart-stopping victories. Goes for it, including a one-point thriller against Temple at the Mullins Center and an epic comeback in Morgantown, West Virginia. I can remember us being down 18 with four minutes to go at West Virginia. We had no business being in that game. We made one shot after the other. Everybody made plays or we couldn't have won that game. There was an amazing play at the end where we missed a free throw and tipped it in to send the game into overtime. They had their whole crowd now was around the the benches in the court ready to ready to rush the court and uh, when we sent the game into overtime <laughs> they had to put their tails between their legs and, and walk back upstairs. <laughs> Mike Williams led the comeback and they won in overtime mathematically I just didn't think that was possible. The Minutemen rolled through the Atlantic 10 winning the regular season title with a 13 and 3 conference mark then taking their fourth straight tournament crown by thrashing rival Temple by 19 in the final. This was not a team that was content just to win the Atlantic 10 tournament. Calipari really thought that this was a team that could play for the national championship. Those really were the expectations, lofty as they were. UMass earned a number two seed in the NCAA East region and easily advanced to the Sweet 16 with blowouts of St. Peter's and Stanford in Albany. The Minutemen then faced Tubby Smith and sixth seeded Tulsa at the Meadowlands in the Sweet 16, a round which no UMass team had previously escaped. This year proved different as UMass dismantled the Golden Hurricane by 25. The UMass Minutemen advanced to the final eight. And stormed into the Elite Eight for the first time in program history. Up next, a date with Eddie Sutton, Bryant Big Country Reeves, and fourth seeded Oklahoma State. That was a tough game. You know, myself personally, I had to go up against Big Country. And <laughs> he was a guy who probably outweighed me by 70 or 80 pounds. 
I think I got into a lot of foul trouble early. Going into the half, we had a nice little cushion, and we all felt like we were going to play a little better in the second half and get to the Final Four, thinking about Sleepless in Seattle was where the Final Four was that year. Lou Rowe had, had a hamstring injury. Edgar Padilla was out for that game. Yet UMass was still winning at halftime. I remember at halftime calling a travel agent and trying, we were trying to price flights to Seattle, thinking as badly as they'd played in that first half, there's no way they were going to play that badly again. It's something that I'll never do again. I walk in at halftime and I said, men, we're going to the Final Four. We're going to be playing in Seattle. They all looked at me. I go, we just shot 28% and we're up five. We're not shooting 28% this second half. Uh, we shot 25% the second half. Saddest day of my life. We thought we were going to go to the Final Four. It wasn't like we were overlooking Oklahoma State. We just thought we were the better team we would win. Big country, they couldn't move him. He got whatever he wanted. And then when their number two guy, shooting guard, Randy Rutherford, when he heated up in the second half, well, there really wasn't any coming back from that. Big country Reeves just was able to really wear down Marcus Camby. And it ends suddenly. Most college basketball seasons do, and it's part of the heartbreak. The Minutemen lost the game, as well as senior leaders Lou Rowe and Derek Kellogg. The good news, after being handled by a stronger player in the Elite Eight game, Camby decided to return to school for his junior season. Marcus knew after that game that he wasn't ready to be a pro. And he came up and, and even said to me, I'm coming back, I'm not ready. My ultimate goal was to try to win the national championship. And, uh, I knew eventually the NBA would be there. And I took that summer as the hardest working summer that I had. I knew I had to come back a better ball player for us to be special. I don't think people expected that the next year they would be better. And I don't think people thought next year they'd be in a position to make a run for the Final Four. So we thought at the time we had our chance. It was a great run. See you later. And that turned out not to be true.